profession um, in terms of membership. And so uh, we, we have an obligation to ensure that um, we make our organization as diverse as possible. So that committee was set up um, thanks to Laura Everett, our current president, for allowing me to have this committee set up and to be able to um, challenge our members to develop some diversity within our organization. Understand that we do have diversity as it exists today. We do have black members, we do have women, we do have um, Latinx, we do have LGBTQ and so on. However, I felt that we could do more. And so taking lead from APA National, we decided that we needed to look at what they have done in the past and use that as some guide. So here we are today. So in my role as immediate past president over the past two years, I've been working with Alyssa. And when I say working with Alyssa, it's more about Alyssa doing all the work because she has been tireless and she has been persistent and she's kept us on track, on target. And I really appreciate all of her input and involvement in this exercise. So um, with that, before I introduce the panel and others, I just wanted to start off with, with a couple quotes that I found very um, engaging and very um, pertinent to our effort and our cause. And that is, um, some of you may know um, James Arthur Baldwin. Um, he, of course, is a famous um, novelist and playwright. Um, in the U.S. He's an, he's an American novelist and he's also an activist and his essays, he's read many, many essays and they are all collected in what's called Notes of a Native Son and in that um, co compilation he talks about the intricacies of racial and sexual and class distinctions in the Western society, most notably in the U.S. And um, three quotes that I really um, appreciate from him the first one is, apathy and ignorance is the price we pay for segregation. I think that's very telling when folks do not pay attention and just accept status quo. The next quote I thought was also very interesting was, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And I think that's a thing what we're trying to do today by saying we need to have this conversation to talk about issues that are of concern to us that need to be brought to light and to have these conversations that which at times can be uncomfortable, but it's needed in order for us to effect some kind of change. And then the final quote that I also thought was very interesting was history is not the past. History is the present we carry our history with us, we are our history. And so when people say things happened in the past, no, we are actually creating history today. This is our first EDI form, this is historic. Um, so, you know, 20, 10, you know, 50 years from now, someone will say, hey, APA Florida had their first EDI form and here was a panel and here are the people that, that were involved. So it's important that we realize that we are creating history and we are part of that effort. So I would be remiss in not recognizing the initial committee and it's kind of evolved and changed over time, but I want to just highlight the names and then I'll go into a little more detail with each of the um, panelists. That hopefully I have all of their um, resumes here, but I don't think I have everyone. But in any event, um, of course, on, on our existing committee today, we have Bob Cambrick, we have Althea Jefferson, we have Angela Van Jones, we have um, Justin Hanna, we have Dan Kirby, we have Michael Zayas Morales, we have Luis Nieves Ruiz, we have Roxanne Reed, of course, Alyssa Barber Torres, we have Erin Young, and we have Jeremy Chastain, one of our newest members to our committee. And we're always looking for additional members to join and participate. As far as the panelists go, um, we have today um, Justin Hanna, Dan Kirby, Dag Marie, um, as being part of our panelists. And unfortunately, and I apologize for this, I only have um, Dan Kirby's resume. So what I'll do, rather than slight any one individual, I'll ask them to introduce themselves when 
they get to that portion of, 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 of the meeting. This way, I don't shortchange anyone because I have this great resume for, for Dan. I've known Dan for many, many years. He's FAIA. Um, you know, he's in the architecture profession, but he's also in the planning profession. So he, he has a, a, an incredible resume. And I feel it'd be important if we, each member at least highlights a little bit about themselves so that they can do themselves justice. And um, with that, um, unless there's anything else, I would um, like to go ahead and turn it over to um, Alyssa to um, talk a little bit about, I guess, to get started on the, I guess, the survey results. I guess that's the next thing on the agenda. Yeah, because I actually went through the overview already. Yes. So yeah, if we can if we can start it, that that'd be great. And again, thank you all for participating today. Uh, we look forward to a very spirited dialogue and hope that um, you'll get something out of this. Thank you, Andre. And I'd like to second his appreciation of all of our committee members. I know uh, Jeremy, Roxanne, and Luis are on this call today with us this this morning. I appreciate that. And as Andre said, we're always looking for more members to get involved, whether it is take on projects or make a longer term commitment. We welcome your participation, your insights, and your ideas at any time. So at this point, we're gonna go over a, just a brief summary of what we heard as a committee from the survey that uh, we were fortunate to have a number of members complete. And if we could go to the next slide, please, Patty. As an overview, we were fortunate to get 234 responses to the survey. Of course, not every participant answered every question, which accounts for some differences in terms of the percentages you may see as we go through this presentation. 15% of respondents had up to five years of experience. So the very important emerging planner, student, new planner cohort is represented there, although we would love to get more participation uh, from that group. And we found that over half of respondents had 20 plus years of experience. So again, just trying to make sure that we have a representative uh, sample and voice from each of our cohorts. So that's something we'll be working on as we gather further input in this process. And as you see, 70% uh, were AICP, AICP candidates or FAICP rep reflecting their stature and tenure in this profession. And there are some other um, percentages here in terms of, of course, most of the respondents work at public sector agencies, reflecting the trends we see among membership. And some other statistics are there as far as all uh, the cohorts that we, we heard from at this point in the process. Next slide, please. In pursuing the survey, we were also interested in learning as much as we could about the identity and identities of the different members we have so we could design programs and services accordingly as we pursue a chapter strategy for equity, diversity, and inclusion. So here are some examples of some of the um, identities that people shared with us in this process. And looking at it, of course, um, the first generation and family to attend college, there were a number of respondents um, from that cohort there, which is important in terms of mentorship, professional development, and establishing a community of support for that and for other characteristics that we see listed here. Next slide, please. And also as well, uh, we were interested in understanding some of the religious diversity of membership and how that's reflected, of course, in a, the professional environments and in our work in practice in different communities. You know, was there some information about different faith traditions that uh, we needed to share to be able to ensure that uh, we're providing inclusive environments, both in workplaces and in Florida's communities. And then finally, the next set of identities we explored were um, veterans, and we did not see uh, uh, very many veteran respondents, which perhaps is something for us to reflect on in terms of how we can get uh, more of those valuable community members within our field. And again, that's something we'll be reflecting on as we develop recommendations. Next slide, please. So looking at the respondents that we heard, again, some of these may not total to 100 on some tables, just reflecting the specific number of respondents we received. We found that almost half of respondents uh, were female or uh, female identified. We had uh, 
a number of black uh, members respond as well, although we would certainly love to hear from more. Our Latinx res Hispanic responses were about 23, about 10% of the groups that we heard from. Asian respondents, at, we had only 12 responses, so we would definitely like to encourage uh, more feedback uh, from that community. And LGBTQ, we had 35 responses and disability 18 for 8%. And we have here, because we do not collect membership information on uh, these types of uh, demographic and identity characteristics, we included the percentage within Florida just to try to give some kind of a, a benchmark or guideline for response and where we mean, may, may need to reach out more to be able to get the amount of feedback that would be helpful for this process. Next slide, please. So in the responses, unfortunately, we heard from members who responded and, and other, part, other members of the community that they have experienced bias in the workplace. And so certainly this is something that through training strategies and other recommendations that we will be looking to address uh, with your help. In looking at the response, I just add from respondents' comments that from the age uh, characteristic, that 61% said they've experienced bias in the workplace, that was at both ends of an aging spectrum, you know, uh, new, very new planners and planners who had been in the workplace for some time, uh, particularly those over 50, uh, felt that they experienced bias or perceptions of their talent and ability based on that characteristic. Uh, of course, you can see the others uh, listed here, and I would draw out as well on the political beliefs. We heard that from both ends of the spectrum, you know, folks who felt that if they shared their commitment to social justice and the issues that they cared about and how they felt that affected the communities in which they work and uh, of which they are members, that they would be perceived a negative way or uh, wouldn't be assigned certain projects, certain opportunities. And then we heard from some members that felt that um, they, their political beliefs relative to um, their conservative philosophies weren't reflected in these, um, these programs. So that's something, again, that we're looking to address as we continue through this process. And, and other characteristics are listed here. Again, the bias in any of these categories is certainly a concern and something that we will be trying to address as, as we move forward. Next slide, please. So there, the positive takeaway uh, from some of the, the responses we heard is that 54% believed workplaces are diverse and inclusive, 79% felt prepared to work in diverse communities, and 69% agreed APA Florida is committed to diversity and inclusion. So uh, certainly that's something that to take into account. At the same time, we are conscious of the fact that uh, many of the respondents to this survey, again, were I believe about 73% white, you know, they were uh, on the older side of the profession in terms of their tenure within the profession and may not have the same needs. And so we are committed to looking at, at these issues in a more nuanced intersectional way to see what the perspectives of different communities within our, our membership, how they feel about these issues. So these aren't laurels that we're going to rest upon, but they're something that we're going to take and unpack from there. So next slide, please. So thank you, Patty. Uh, the, uh, to look at the needs that we have as we drill down into uh, the survey feedback that we received, 46% of respondents, all respondents, felt employers should increase, their employers should increase diversity of their coworkers and management. Unfortunately, 38% of our respondents felt they have to work harder to be perceived as talented due to their identity, whether it was their age, their race, their uh, ethnic background, disability. And so again, an area of focus that we are working hard to overcome. 26% unfortunately felt their background and identity would hinder their promotion and advancement. And that's something that uh, we'll be highlighting in training that we'll discuss in just a moment. Next slide, please. So in terms of other recommendations, of course, the survey had some open-ended uh, questions to be able to encourage your feedback, your suggestions, which you would like to see from your chapter. 
in the responses, 35% would like a mentor. And I think it's important to stress that uh, similar to the APA National Mentorship Program, the idea is not that older members or more established members of our, our membership would be, it would be a one-way mentorship to emerging professionals. The thought was mentors might be needed for members at any point in their career, at any age. So it's really a broad uh, understanding of what might be needed and what might be gained through that type of a program. And so that's what we're taking forward with us. 60% would like to participate in sensitivity training or other discussions, say around book clubs or particular issues, forums, much like this one. Other recommendations we heard are that the chapter um, should review the leadership and the committee membership to do an assessment of um, inclusivity there and to see what uh, new leaders may need to be brought forward in those settings. That a chapter award for diverse workplaces was recommended as a way of highlighting the good work that many firms and agencies are doing in creating the, the workplaces we want and deserve. The training for agency leadership, management, and even elected officials on diversity and avoiding bias is key. Some respondents felt that their elected officials, if they didn't fit certain demographic characteristics, didn't take their recommendations as seriously. So they recommended the elected official training the chapter offers with conferences feature that, um, that concern and provide some uh, support for overcoming and avoiding bias. And also creating extensive partnerships across professional associations and with community organizations. Of course, there's a lot of nonprofits doing wonderful work in Florida's communities and members felt that building those partnerships with them to make sure that uh, we're providing an inclusive practice as well as bringing some of their leadership into the planning field as citizen planners with us was something that we needed to pursue. Next slide, please. Other recommendations we heard are that e uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion training for planners would be helpful, but that folks wanted to see an actual strategy or actions for advocacy and change within the profession. So to merely offer the training as a one way was not seen as being adequate, that it needs to be part of a larger um, architecture of uh, progress forward in the field and, and taking that into account. Leadership training with outside experts was seen as valuable, bringing in um, people from around the region, around the country that have addressed these issues successfully or within their associations um, and making that investment was seen as key. Outreach to colleges, historically black colleges and universities of which Florida is lucky to have four. High schools and even children, to, similar to the APA ambassador program in which some of us participate, bringing folks an awareness of the participation and the ability to build capacity and partnerships was seen as, as being key. Offering scholarships, conference speaking and networking opportunities for the visibility of, of all members, webinars, online forums and conference sessions all were recommended. And of course, uh, the Florida Planning Conference this year will feature several of those and we look forward to additional suggestions. Next slide, please. So our next steps is, of course, as I mentioned, we'll be assessing responses in more detail for uh, distinct respondent identities and also doing intersectional analysis to realize how the, the identities that people have uh, relate to each other and to the community in terms of their professional practice and needs and developing appropriate recommendations for that. We'll be uh, completing some of this analysis by the next scheduled feedback session. As I mentioned, the Florida Planning Conference will have another session like this on Wednesday evening. Uh, we look forward to your participation and please recommend it to others. And of course, you should feel free to send the chapter input and comments at any time. Uh, there is a EDI page on the website with um, the chapter's recent statement on the killing of George Floyd and the focus on equity that we all need to have, particularly as AICP members in the Code of Ethics. And so this is a dialogue that we hope to continue with you in, in many settings and look forward to your comments and suggestions and that contact form on that page. Next slide, please. So to, final, uh, to finish our discussion of the survey and the overview, we just wanted to, to make sure that we brought you the voice of members, the feedback of members, the concern of members, um, based on their identity and the needs that they felt that they had and the experiences that they're having in this profession. And certainly it's a challenge when, you know, you see things like, for example, on this slide where a planner says, you know, 
residents interact with staff who are white dis and disregard me, you know, that the chapter needs to have some uncomfortable conversations to be, again, able to have the community that many of us want and deserve in this profession. And that, you know, the, the field is perceived as being majority white, upper, middle to upper class and male, and how we can change that to, to bring about um, a more diverse and equitable practice. Next slide, please. So looking at some of the response from black members, um, there was a, a thought that we really needed some tangible efforts to improve communities and that the, merely having the numbers, so to speak, is not enough. That we really need to make sure that inclusion is a focus and identity is celebrated and welcome. And certainly that's the, the profession to which we aspire. That systemic racism continues to be a barrier that um, hurts many people, many communities, and many careers. And that we needed to help eradicate it by supporting people in a variety of ways including advancing career and negotiating salary. And I know this has been a focus of APA's Women in Planning Division. Um, several of their Florida-based leaders have provided a lot of resources there. And changing the way uh, we do business, even in light of some of the context we work in and, and the challenges there. Next slide, please. So hearing from our Hispanic, Latino, Latinx uh, members, we did hear some comments about concerns that you know, there's a, a balance between appreciating the difference that people have and then making them feel different in perhaps ways that they, they don't feel welcome. And so that's an interesting point of reflection for all of us uh, in terms of not making people tokens, but just appreciating them as individuals within their communities and, and what their goals and needs are. Uh, the fact that, as Andre mentioned, you know, being the only one at the table, you know, that if you're a female and Latina, that still may be the case for you, even in 2020. And then we received, of course, a number of excellent suggestions about recruitment, retention, promotion, um, management, best practices to making office and workplaces more diverse and welcoming. And so a lot of great uh, content here for us to work with, but really speaking to the need to look at these things uh, throughout um, people's careers and making sure that they can reach the next levels of their careers uh, more successfully and easily. Next slide, please. And then again, uh, unfortunately, we did not receive uh, as, as many responses from the Asian community as we would have liked, and that's something we'll continue to focus on. Uh, the concerns, of course, that we see represented from uh, here are microaggressions, stereotyping, um, how we need to educate children and adults on the benefits of inclusion and diversity that there was uh, some positive experiences, which of course we, we are happy about. And, but at the same time, the concern that folks, especially within the private sector, are more likely to hire and promote people who are privileged, who um, may be doing that based on race or existing relationships that they have that aren't quite as diverse, and that uh, mentorship is a way to overcome some of these needs. Next slide, please. And moving to our last couple of, of portraits of the different communities we heard from, the LGBTQ community uh, did feel the need to shift the conversation, lessons learned, and provide platforms like this one um, to be able to ensure that representation is taking place across our different communities, uh, our different committees and leadership roles that we have, as well as the practice in general and how we can make the profession more welcoming by supporting minority communities, making important statements as allies, uh, recognizing pride and other milestones on, on the calendar uh, for groups that recognize um, their, their needs, their history and their humanity. And then also too, recognizing uh, some of the folks we have in Florida who are have doing and have done tremendous work on this, these issues like Dr. Petra Doan and bringing folks like that into our, our programming and our activities as a resource to share their expertise. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, uh, from the disability community, again, we would love to hear more. Um, the experience that people had was that APA Florida could do more to ensure equitable access to opportunities and consider a spectrum of disability, including um, things like being neurotypical or the disabilities that sometimes folks don't quote unquote see, but affect us, our experiences and our practice, um, and that do need support from our community and our workplaces. And looking at the um, 
planning programs and the experience that people are having in planning schools where they feel like their cohort of students, perhaps their professors are not as diverse and, and uh, inclusive in terms of training them at that very onset of their career and how we might look to and support that. And again, important advice for all of us that we need to hire them, promote them, pay them fairly, mentor them and give them equal opportunity. And going outside of our network of friends to hire people, give them those opportunities and to be willing to listen and learn. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that's what we're committed to doing today and as an EDI committee. So thank you. And with that, uh, I'll be turning it over to uh, Bob Cambridge for a discussion of the ground rules in our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Before I turn it over to Bob, can I just interject one thing that I neglected to do at the very beginning? And that was to just read for you our diversity, inclusion, equity, diversity, inclusion mission statement. I think that also helps kind of set the stage for our conversations as we move forward. And I'll just read it for you in case you may not have seen it. And that is APA Florida celebrates equity, diversity, and inclusiveness and believe we can accomplish more through a genuine and authentic partnership with others and promote a commitment to excellence in service to Florida's communities. We strive to make our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion integral to our organizational structure, policies, committees, staff, sponsors, goals, and vision. We want to engage people of all backgrounds and experiences and seek to foster a culture of respect, openness, learning, integrity, honesty, and finally, a sense of fun. So we spent weeks crafting that, and I think that really encapsulates what we want to be about as an organization. With that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Hey, Andre, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. This is an issue, um, I've been in the profession for 30 years, and um, I think it's a positive thing that we're still having this conversation. Um, it's a little disappointing at times because when I started um, grad school in 1988, we were talking about diversity and planning. And so um, the idea today is that we wanna learn from you. We wanna hear from you. We wanna learn from your experiences, your perspectives. We want to make sure we, uh, that we understand. We want you to understand that we know that all points of view are very important and that we can disagree while having conversations around this issue without being disagreeable. And so when we open it up and start asking for your um, points of view, um, we have on the screen right now the ground rules, but basically all they're, all they're saying is be civil, um, allow um, everyone respect that you would want, and that's how we move forward. I want to take up too much time because I know everyone already knows this stuff, and so I'll be quiet for a limited amount of time. And I think we're now going into the panel. Um, I guess I'll start introducing myself. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Dagmarie Segarra. Um, I'm, I'm senior planner at the Seminole County Planning Department in Sanford, Florida. I've been, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I moved to Central Florida in 1996. I've been practicing planning for over eight years. Um, all has been in uh, public uh, uh, with government, and um, and yeah, that's um, and I've been member of the APA for over five years now. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, Bob Cambrick, um, like I said a few minutes ago, I've been in the profession for over thirty years. I've worked in the public sector. I've worked in the private sector. Um, for both um, companies as well as my own. And um, my issue has always been about 
um, community development from the aspect of residents and how do we address those, especially um, the people that have difficulty and have had difficulty as part of being um, recognized and having their needs met. Um, that includes um, people of color, that includes lower income people, and it also includes our LGBTQ um, plus communities. And so um, I'm going to now go to, I think, Justin for him to introduce himself. Thanks, Bob. Um, my name is Justin Hanna. I've been in the profession for just about just under 10 years, just about 10 years now. Um, I've worked in both the private sector and public sector. Um, my, my, my specific focus has really been um, on transportation planning uh, specifically. Um, and so my experience kind of, um, kind of deals with uh, transportation in both the public and private sector. Um, and so with, with that kind of my own personal interest with this is kind of in um, not only professionally, but also personally and seeing kind of transportation and kind of the issues surrounding it um, and how it affects also minority communities and kind of kind of getting people to understand and see that transportation is, is a right and not a privilege. And so the way that, that that has been kind of, you know, how that how that's been pervaded out in society and kind of how it is today is it's been more of kind of like a privilege and that, you know, the the, the opportunities for, for better transportation and to just the just mobility to get around where you live um, has not been um, has not been equi not been distributed equitably. So that's just been something that I've been kind of personally and professionally interested in. Um, and so I'm kind of joining this group and kind of talking about some of these issues has been um, um, eye opening for it and, and pretty enjoyable to me. So happy to be here. Bob, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, Dan Kirby, uh, Andre mentioned, uh, I'm a planner and an architect uh, based in Orlando. Uh, I work in the people in places uh, practice of Jacobs. Uh, I am currently a principal and a client services leader for Florida and Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm an AICP fellow and also a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Um, what really has, has drawn me back again and again to this work is really um, uh, starts with the root of our obligation as planners to uh, serve in the public interest. And there is a, a direct line um, uh, to equity, diversity, and inclusion work. So I look forward to sharing more um, about my perspective on that. Okay, so, um, Zach Marie, would you like to start um, in terms of just simply giving um, your perspective in terms of what we're doing here in the panel and um, getting us ready for getting additional information? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Bob. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I've been in the plan practicing planning for over eight years and, um, and by being born and raised in Puerto Rico, planning is not a big um, uh, public interest over there in, in Puerto Rico. So when I moved here to Central Florida, it was a brand new world for me and learning and experience it. Uh, one of the things that I my experience throughout all these years is how um, the lack of diversity, um, and not only in the Latino community, but also female perspective, uh, female Latinas in the, in the uh, field, um, I can only speak on the Central Florida experience that I had um, has been very, um, um, it's been lacking. Um, it has improved in the past few years. Um, more women uh, have, are climbing in the, into the management positions, but typically um, the majority of the women that I have worked with um, in the planning field has been in the tech, you know, uh, either administratively or technical aspects and not management. Uh, many times, um, one of the reasons that I'm so interested about this committee and be part of the committee is uh, when I look around at the table as one of the one of the surveyors or, or one of the uh, yeah one of the um, responders were that um, it's 2020 and I look around at the table and I am the only Hispanic Latina uh, women in the table. Um, sometimes um, it's almost like another respondent said, um, it was like I'm the token. I work at places that not only, I call, I, like I said before, as sad as it sounds, 
I, I check all the boxes. I am the minority, I am the Hispanic, and I am the woman. So, uh, and it's like they, you know, um, and, and my experiences have been for the most part positive, but sometimes it makes me wonder. I mean, I'm not, if you look at me, um, unless you hear my accent, <laughs> you might not perceive me as a Hispanic uh, Latina. I have many um, anecdotes with other um, uh, coworkers that they look more Hispanics than I do and people start talking Spanish to them and totally ignore me. <laughs> But uh, it makes me wonder sometimes because of the way I look, the fair skin, um, blonde hair, light color, um, you know, eyes, uh, it has, it, it, it's more approachable. And I think um, my, and I can go on with different experiences from the hair to the accent, to the, to the fact that I'm a woman in this uh, field. But uh, I, I'm, I'm really want to hear uh, from the perspective of, of not only the, the Hispanic community, because, I mean, diversity is such a broad concept. I mean, we got this disability, we have LGBTQ. Um, so, yeah, um, it's something that we, I, I'm hoping that with starting these conversations had, would take us to that next level and and we can be more pro, uh, proactive than reactive. And Dan? Yeah, I'll, you know, I, I wanna start with this. You know, I, I ask you to ponder this um, while, while I share some of uh, experiences and, and background with you is, you know, are we even having the same conversation? Uh, in, in, you can consider that question uh, from a number of perspectives uh, as you think about um, your work colleagues and, and your friends and, and particularly what this current moment uh, has meant um, to addressing issues of uh, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So on this past Monday, the company I work for, Jacobs, we released our action plan for advancing equity and justice. And we made that public, it's on our website. You can go to www.jacobs.com and I can, I'll tell you more about that if uh, time permitting, but that, that is a good resource there because we have as an organization put in the work to have the conversations and to get to a point where real commitments uh, were made. And it, and it has not been uh, an easy set of, of discussions or easy to make these commitments. So just let me share a bit of my story with you um, and, and, and um, you know, just as a way of, of uh, helping you kind of understand where, where at least I'm coming from. Um, I'm a native of Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and, and up until fourth grade, my entire experience uh, was that of being, you know, a black child in a black neighborhood attending a black school taught by black teachers, going to a black church. At Christmas time, we had black Santa Claus. You know, we, racial strife was something I, I saw on TV. I heard people talk about it. But in my existence as a child, I didn't see it because I was in a bit of a cocoon where I was allowed to concentrate on being the best I could be. And I, and I think in a lot of ways, that's a, a, an experience that a lot of majority um, people have. Well, that all changed um, when I hit fifth grade. So in, instead of continuing on at the public school in Newark, my parents sent me to a, a private school in suburban Newark, completely different experience. Uh, you know, instead of being you know, one among um, mostly all African-American kids, I was suddenly to school with 500 kids and five of them were, were any kind of person of color. So I was the other and that flipped the whole everything for me. Um, my background and any experiences I had were not valued. I was called the N-word. I had at least one teacher that I could tell then even was openly hostile to me being even present in his class. Um, so I've seen what it is in a lifetime to be included and excluded. Um, 
I knew what it was like to be celebrated. I knew what it was like to be ostracized. Uh, as an African-American in America and being a black in America, I accept that duality in that I claim both being you know, fully American and understanding that I'm black in America. Um, my identity as an American was something that was really hard won uh, by my ancestors and I don't feel like it's anything I ever have to ask for or seek permission for. Um, I've entered into this profession where I've made a commitment in both cases, or, or one case to act in the public interest, and another where I pledged and, and legally am required to protect public health, safety, and welfare. So fast forward to graduate school. Um, I was a grad student at Michigan, University of Michigan. I was elected the um, national chair of the APA Student Representative Council. And I'm traveling around to different um, schools, speaking with planning student groups and feeling pretty good about that. Um, I went to Seattle on a trip to speak there. I was there for three days. Um, two, for the first two days, absolutely excellent experience. I showed up with my jacket and my tie on um, and, and was treated you know, really well and it was a great experience. Third day I show up looking like a student. I was tracked by the campus police for two hours. Uh, I was pulled out of class uh, because I fit the description of a suspect, fit the description. And I will never forget um, the officer saying the words legitimate visiting scholar as they cleared me and said I had a, a real reason to be there. Um, you know, my legitimacy was called into question and it was called into question without question, right? You, you probably don't belong here. So in this moment where we've seen Breonna Taylor, George Floyd um, killed, my, like a lot of people, my first emotion in that was um, to get really angry. And, it, and, and the anger came from people being deprived of their humanity. So it was really hard uh, at the beginning, and it still is at times to even talk about that, right? My next emotion I went through was um, really a bit of sadness thinking about how little um, things had changed and, and, and the battles that were fought by my parents, my grandparents. And I really want to live in a moment to be hopeful again. So let's consider what we could do. So we all know, hey, this starts with being able to talk. Um, being able to talk is not the end of it. We've got to, of course, do what we do as planners. Let's find the data. Let's measure it. Let's hold ourselves and our colleagues accountable for, for where we go. Um, some things I do want to share with you. Everybody is not going to get this. Um, it's a journey. Um, nobody, none of us get these conversations perfect. And I encourage you, as they say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, we have to adopt some baseline for having these conversations. That's why I said, are we even having the same conversation? Um, when we think of things um, such as uh, uh, racism, bias, and oppression, we have to understand they operate on a lot of levels. We have to understand that they are ideological, they're institutional, they're interpersonal, and, and they are internalized. We are all dealing with those issues. Um, there is a real price to inequity. And we as planners see that in our communities every day. So if we're really going to do that thing of planning in the public interest, we have to have all types of planners involved and we have to be inclusive in our efforts. Uh, those efforts um, are not just you coming in as the all-knowing planner with, as a subject matter expert. We do know a lot, right? We're educated, we have experience, but approach this practice not from a position of charity, but from being inclusive and engaging people. So if you are struggling with, you know, where do I go with this? I would say that instead of thinking, oh, they just want me to be politically correct, think of it personally and think about decency and just really strive to be decent to other human beings, have the conversations and let it grow and, and really flourish from there. Uh, thank you, Dan. 
Um, I'm still in quickly um, um, give you a little bit of background where I'm coming from. Um, I've spent a lot of my career um, doing facilitation and mediation. Um, and in doing that, oftentimes I'm as a planner removed from the role of participation. Um, and my experience is that we were having issues that are affecting communities of color, lower income communities, um, affecting um, LGBTQ populations. But when the facilitations, when the community meetings are happening, the representatives of those populations, even as planners, as, as specifically as constituents, are not at the table. And then when the recommendations and decisions are being acted on by elected officials and appointed officials, um, no one cares that those populations are not being represented in the conversation. And they don't care because, well, the public notice was posted. They didn't show up. I guess they didn't want to be part of it. Um, but they don't explore why people are not part of the conversation. They don't explore the ways in which systemic behaviors has precluded participation in the past um, and then allow people to say, why should I participate? Because they've ignored me all this time and they're gonna continue to do so. And um, one of the things that also I've noticed when I started my career in Tallahassee and I also was working in some of the smaller rural communities that surround Tallahassee um, with communities and cities of 134 people um, you know, that I was working in and I wasn't, I was seen, but not seen. Uh, my blackness was not to be addressed. My queerness was not to be addressed. And so if I'm not going to be addressed as the planner or the facilitator or the mediator, I'm struggle to see how could people that are part of those communities of which I'm, I've mentioned that I'm part of, how they are wanting to come to the table and how their needs are being addressed. And so I'm hoping that one of the, I mean, some of the things that happen um, today is we hear how we do, and I've been breaking this down into three components in my head. And the three components are, how do we ensure that the people that are entering the profession, whether it's from grad school or some other way, how do we ensure that we're getting diverse representations of the available um, populations. Um, how do we then, the next one being, how do we retain people in the profession? How do we ensure not only are we retaining, but we're giving people opportunities, not just opportunities, they're at being promoted and they're rising in the profession. And then the third thing is how do we make sure that we learn from the experiences of our diverse friends our diverse practicing planners, and we apply that to better serving our communities um, and, and all communities with needs. And that includes people with disabilities, that includes people, um, um, LGBTQ populations, that includes minority populations, that includes women. We wanna make sure that, and also we're dealing with the issues of age. Uh, one of the things I did a couple of years ago, I was doing a facilitation uh, for a community and the largest gathering were from skate punks. They were kids that were literally showed up and took over. Um, I worked with them, they were at their own table. They sat down, they started designing their own skate park. Um, they came up with their own marketing campaign for them for, to present at the community meeting, which was, if dolls can have parks, why can't skaters? And um, they also had a marketing campaign where they brought a skateboard that they had painted and they all had signed and they found the one politician in the room that was in favor of their idea and they took pictures with that politician and it hit social media, local newspaper. And at each stage, they were active. Um, but what wound up happening was that they're not a constituent group that votes. And so when the time came, the politicians went, oh, we're concerned about liability. Although we kept telling them, Florida provides immunity for uh, public skate parks. 
They use that as the out. And I, I earnestly believe that group of kids, and the group of kids also, what I call them skate punks, as they were calling themselves, they were diverse. And they were because the, our kids are teaching us. And what they did was they designed their park based on the needs of all the kids. Um, the idea was that they were going to put it in a regional park that the community, the city already owned. Well, the problem was the kids can't get to it unless their parents have cars and drive them there. But they can't get there by bicycle. The bus, does, the bus only goes half of the way. Um, the reason why they couldn't get there by bicycle is that it's a winding country road that's two lanes with no shoulders. It was dangerous. They couldn't walk to it. And so they chose, they took a list of, um, the areas that were available already owned by the city and they got things done. Well, I, I'd be on, I will be honest with you, I believe that group of kids are permanently lost from participating in the future because they did all that effort and they weren't heard. And so recognizing the youth as well as our elderly, the spectrum of needs and what are we gonna do about that? And so with that, um, I'm going to turn to our other panelists very quickly and see if there are any other additional comments that they want to make. Um, and we'll then take the next step after that. I was just going to pivot off of what you were saying. I hope one of the things that we kind of, that we can kind of take from this, from this discussion, this panel is, you know, we might, we may get into talking about issues and some things that may seem like they're a hundred miles away from each other or that, oh, this is, I, I understand and I hear it, but how does this really affect what I do or what, what you know, what I, I, what I get to see every day? And I think what you kind of touched on there, Bob, was just like presenting that opportunity for people to engage in these things. And it's not, I think too often that when, whether it is a, a community meeting or whether it's even just the, the, the discussion and the plans of something that's being formed, I think too often they're kind of done with a narrow focus of, who that constituent is, whether it, it whether it is from a racial background or even an income background or an age background, and it's you know it's things are too narrowly focused, and then when it comes down to actually you know putting it in a community or having people want to engage with this, and then we wonder why we we have a public meeting and then all the people there at the meeting look the same, or they all kind of have same kind of the same impact, they have kind of the same thoughts. And there, you kind of, you, you lose that real sense of that community and who is in that community and who you're actually trying to plan for. And so I hope one of the things that we, that people that are kind of in this panel or, in, or that are listening to this kind of take away is, you know, when you get into your communities and get into your work, how can you kind of open up that tent? How can you open up that door to provide more engagement and then not ask, you know, why we didn't get these people to come in? What is more so asking, what didn't we do? or what didn't what didn't I do to have more people be engaged and to, to feel comfortable enough to kind of engage in these topics and so um, I think what you were kind of going on about was really important I think that um, I hope a lot of us can kind of take that take that away from this discussion thank you Justin and with that I'd just like to remind folks if you don't mind to please share your comments your suggestions your reflections about your experience any of the things we saw in the survey results anything that the panelists are sharing uh, please uh, enter them in the chat and I know we'll be opening up the floor for attendee comments in just a moment uh, as the panel concludes we've already received uh, some great feedback on disability issues and I hope we'll hear more um, from attendees. So please um, reach out and we're happy to hear from you. Thank you. And, and Dan, I'm going to remind you of this session. If you would also um, give us your experience from AIA, um, some of the things that they've gone through, um, their, your, their work there on diversity, equity, inclusion issues, and some things that we may learn from them um, uh, yes. Yeah. Happy to do that, and probably the you know the very best resources for this will will be um, online, and we can we can make those available. Um, and, and some of this work happened, not some of it, a lot of it happened has been happening over the years. Um, you saw a big movement many years ago in in the architecture profession towards 
um, recognizing issues of sustainability. And I, I think there is starting to be a similar groundswell around having equitable practice, uh, although that, that group of people talking about it may not have been uh, nearly as expansive. But AIA, um, um, together with, I think it was Cornell University some years ago, put together this guide to equitable practice. And it sort of walks you through first how to engage the conversation in your firm and to start having these discussions. And then each stage to move through and how to um, address the further development of having a more equitable firm, right? So that's, that's one of the things. More recently, there have been, at all levels of AIA, um, both the, and, and, and just realize where AIA is as a profession. So less than, it's about 3% of architects are African-American. I'm, I'm using that perspective because that's the one I understand. And less than, there are less than 400 African-American women that have been registered architects in the US ever. Just think about that. All time, less than 400. So, you know, it's, it's a rare breed um, uh, in, in the profession. So, you know, there, there, there are roadmaps and there are steps, but more recently, there have been a lot of these dialogues um, in, in our uh, local components, um, just exactly these kinds of things, and there have been commitments made. And what we're seeing is firms stepping up and making commitment, big firms making commitments, um, entering relationships with HBCUs, talking about how they're going to procure work, how they're going to take care of their um, employees. I, I, will, I will just share just briefly so in our own commitment is 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 jacobs and we're a multidisciplinary large company 55,000 person company right so we're, we're huge um but we we said there's three things that we're going to or, or we've got three areas that we're doing work in um one to amplify our culture of belonging so that is make sure that everybody um feels like they are part of and that they're valued and we can kind of go and take off the the, the things under that. But the second one is that we are going to recruit, retain, and advance, in particular this moment, a focus on um, black employees. And there's a commitment at all levels of the company over the next three years that, that that is going to happen and people are going to be measured, senior leaders in the company, on how that takes place. Um, there's you know, further diversity at the board of directors level even, so the highest level of the company. And then, and then third, to really kind of put our money where our mouth is and contribute to structural change in the broader society. So there's been a commitment, $10 million over the next five years of support of uh, um, education, professional development, scholarship opportunities. So, um, you know, just to make that very real and that coming out of this moment, I'll tell you to us as, you know, people in the Black Employees Network uh, has been just, you um, uh, uh, tremendous in helping to shape and develop that and to see not just lip service but a commitment at the very top levels of, of, of our company to um, uh, flow through the entire organization. Uh, thanks, Sam. And one of the things I want to um, just throw out there also um, I'm going to be doing a panel with, I know Alyssa mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Petra Doan and some other members um, for the virtual conference um, that's going to be dealing with planning for LGBTQ populations. Um, one of the things that I know Dr. Doan, um, who was one of my professors um, when I was at FSU, um, that we've been talking about is um, the issues that um, deal with um, the needs of LGBTQ um, residents, um, especially when it comes to the idea of community um, and making sure that there are opportunities within how communities are planned and function. There are opportunities for LGBTQ populations to gather, um, how they gather, how they gather safely. And this especially is important. We're noticing increasingly, I know Quality Florida has been looking at this issue, um, is how do we deal with our LGBTQ youth, especially those who have been abandoned by their families? Um, how do we make sure that there's adequate housing? Where's that housing? 
how they continue uh, making sure they get their education, um, and how do we make sure that one of the awful things that winds up happening, and we know where there's what there those areas are in our communities um, where um, people are engaging in sex work, or and we don't want our youth or anyone else falling into that. And so we want to try to see how do we address those needs um, from a planning perspective. You know, my background is a, as was, I was a land use planner, growth management, um, back when that was all Florida could think about was 163. And um, back in those days, if you could count, you can plan. And so <laughs> um, as uh, Justin knows, if you could figure out how many trips are going somewhere, that was, that's what's important. But we've moved away from that. And we need to start talking about the holistic aspect of planning for communities. And we have to start with who are the people that we're planning for and what do they need? And that's the continuing part of this conversation, I think, as well. I would like to add, Bob, to what you just said about being conscious about the community that you are working in and you are representative. I worked at a place that um, the percentage of Hispanics were really high, but when we were used to do community meetings, they were not where to be seen, and they were not either representative in the local government either. So it's very, I know as a, a government employee, you, we have to, you know, part of what we do is politics. Politics unfortunately gets involved in what we're trying, we're trying to do the right thing. And there's a lot of perception out there when it comes to minorities and, 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 and income. Um, there's, there's always the pushback when we're trying to provide public transportation for some area because you know the income in that area will sustain that, that transportation aspect. But then when you're trying to bring it to the community, those are not the people that are showing up to the community, or at least are not the most outspoken in the community. And then, then, and then we had the situation that we have, we have to follow some directions. And, um, and when we're trying to advocate for this group of people, in my case, when I was trying to advocate for a boys and girls club in a community that was really needed, but the community did not show up and the people that show up were people outside from that community that they didn't want it. It was really hard. So I think part of, I can only speak from the Latino aspect that because in our, in our communities as a Latin, we're, you know, as an immigrants, um, or, or, or experiences in that, in that kind of sort of things were not as, as important as it is here. We don't get involved, and, 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 it's, and it's us as planners a responsibility to reach out to that community. Um, we can say that, you know, we can blame it in whoever, we can blame it on the system, we can blame it on the, on, on the politics, but I think I, because I am part of that community, and I know this community is big, it is my responsibility to reach out to that community to make sure that they show up. And, and there's and, and cry and try to, to, to break those walls that are between the perceptions of what a, a specific community is. Um, and I think as a planner and working in the government, that's our biggest challenge. How do we represent me as a Latina? How I do would represent the needs of that community? If we're not reaching to them and 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 politics get in the way, um, and but we have to be advocates. Like you said, planning is no longer as about numbers. Now it has become a holistic thing that we have to look at the broad spectrum of 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 the needs of the community, and 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 I think. Um, one of the things that I want the people that I hear today to understand, and like as I mentioned it again, I can only speak from my own experience, but there is this perception that, you know, when you when you have an accent, you are not intelligent enough. If you're not pronouncing something, you're not intelligent enough. 
And I know uh, some, uh, a lot of my um, fellow planners, uh, minority planners, that would agree with me is that we have to work harder to prove ourselves. And that was reflected in the survey. It's so interesting how was that reflected in the survey that, that because we are part of a minority group, we have to not be 100%, we have to be 120% to then be able to be take it seriously. And, 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 um, and that's something that we definitely can improve in the community as planners. And, and, and we can be better advocates if, if, if they let us, <laughs> if they let us be the advocate and the voice for the people. Well, thank you for those comments, Dagmarie, and, and for the comments of all of the panelists, so, who of course will continue to engage throughout the rest of our session. Um, as we turn now to attendee feedback, I just wanted to uh, reference some of the input that we've heard in the chat so far, and thank you for all of the comments. Please keep them coming. Uh, we heard from uh, Nathan Wira, Wira, I apologize, Nathan, correct me uh, in just a moment on, on how to pronounce your name. Happy to um, get that right. And who suggested that the workshop sh should feature not only experts, but also community representatives, although in some cases they can be the same, um, but to just get that diverse leadership of these training events to really gain the perspectives of the communities that are being represented in a holistic manner. So thank you for that suggestion. And we also heard uh, some comments uh, from Melissa Dickens of the APA Women in uh, Planning Division Leadership about the essential need for data and trying to work with APA National to help us get to know our members better and, and to have their identities represented. And certainly uh, we'll be working on that. We heard from Laura Everett, of course, the president, as Andre mentioned, who uh, convened this EDI committee. And I know the incoming president, Wyatt Bowers, is also on the call today. Both have expressed a tremendous support for our efforts and engaged us in reviewing things like the legislative policy platform and the strategic operating plan of the chapter. So they uh, referenced that work in the chat and definitely want to uh, express our appreciation for that support at the leadership level. And looking at some of the other comments, I know uh, Ruth Steiner at the University of Florida, Dr. Steiner uh, recommends um, taking a look at and having some of our panelists perhaps address how we're coordinating with committees and leadership within APA Florida and perhaps even at the national level uh, in that broader sense and appreciates the broad discussion of diversity in terms of how we've characterized it in the survey and our conversation today. So thank you for that. I know Mary Moskowitz I see is um, mentioning that many respondents work in the public sector and that it, the challenges of hiring in the public sector in terms of recruiting and getting the word out about um, different positions and how we can do that. Um, I, I want to mention, too, uh, for folks who follow the Black Urbanist, um, Chris, Kristen Jeffers is a tremendous resource, especially um, in different communities and trying to bring this leadership work forward. The Black Urbanist, uh, she keeps a job board and a network, so you can actually find diverse candidates and share your opportunities with diverse candidates uh, with her as a resource, and she is also listed on our EDI resources on the chapters page and welcome any suggestions from others uh, for folks we need to be following, reading, watching to get uh, better at these uncomfortable conversations and share our perspectives. And I know I'm seeing a comment from Conroy Jacobs about APA Florida providing members with resources to report harassment and discrimination and getting some good resources together for workplaces. So thank you for that comment and uh, comments about uh, coaching and mentorship to address those who have been traumatized by those experiences, you know, similar to the ones that panelists have shared for us. Like what is the best way to kind of resolve um, the immediate crisis of that and perhaps even find help elsewhere. So great suggestions we're seeing in the chat. And with that, let me say, um, as we keep this conversation going uh, for the remainder of our hour, I know we're going to do a wrap up at 1250, but this time is really yours to be able to share with us your recommendations, your concerns, something we miss, something you wanna see more of. And of course, we can always put the survey presentation back up to look at initial recommendations from the survey respondents more specifically. If you would like to make a comment and have yourself unmuted by our moderator, uh, please raise your hand in Zoom. Um, any 
of those types of reactions will be noted and we'll announce your name and our moderator, Patty Shea with the chapter, who's a tremendous resource for our committee's work. Definitely want to acknowledge her as well. Uh, Patty will unmute you to, to start that conversation with us. So with that, uh, we'll look for um, those reactions. Thank you, looking forward to hearing from you. Nathan's unmuted. Okay, yeah, I just Welcome, wanted to, I wanted to wait till I had, I didn't talk over anyone. I, um, I, I, I'm Nathan Moira. You, you're probably the first person to pronounce it correctly the first time. I <laughs> always get mispronounced. It's always weird. I always hear that. So it's, I give you credit for getting it right the, on the first try. Mm -hmm. so it, I, I have a mild disability and mildly autistic, and I, and I, and I want to say that I think a big part of diversity is I'm still learning my own challenges and my own so I can't be critical of others when I'm still finding it a daily thing of learning what what it is I'm dealing with because I don't have I'm very outgoing which I is unusual in the community so it isn't but I deal with some of the side aspects in I've I, I didn't say where I work because I I've been out of college eight years, and of those eight years, I've been working and planning only two of those eight years, which tells you out of school, I've worked two out of eight years in planning. The rest has been retail and other things just till I can find something, and I've found it's turning into more the side job is planning and the real career is doing not using my degree because I can't find work. I think that's a reality is I, most job coaches will tell people with disabilities not to even tell that your interviewer you have it because it, you're less likely to get hired. And that, that's a reality of the, that things are still where we aren't even comfortable being open and straightforward about it. But I find that in the interview process, I get rejected. I've been to hundreds of over 100 interviews since I lost my, was out of work two years ago and never got, got zero job offers, which you, whether I wouldn't say every case I was discriminated against, there were probably a lot of cases, most cases, that I was I was there was just better candidates selected in the process. But to say out of a hundred interviews and ten times that in application sent out, I wasn't the best candidate at least one time is hard is hard to believe. I mean. That's a frustrating thing. And it, I mean, I think what happened when I was at my previous job is I don't, I tend to take criticism and try to improve myself and listen. Don't necessarily argue back to defend myself. I'm not super great at defending myself in a situation where I've been criticized, at least initially. It tends to get me written up in more written up cases. It ends up being you get let go. And this is an issue that happens a lot in the autism community. I was looking recently doing some research on it, and I've heard as high as 90% of people with autism are under unemployed, which is extremely high. And I, and it's just shocking when you go, I'm not the only one dealing with it. And it even when they say they're going diver, for diversity, have a certain number of people with disabilities hired, you find that those people are maintenance, lower, they're not professional positions. You don't see people with disabilities get promoted. You don't see people with disabilities getting office professional positions because 
because of their disability. I, I was told as a kid, you're going to be mopping floors for the rest of your life. Like that's the reality of, of where things are. And I don't think it's, as, it's gotten better. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, a lot of people like me would have been thrown in a, in a institution, institutionalized. So th we've, I've seen improvement over the years, but it's still frustrating when you see people you graduate with college start able to working, have 10 years of experience in their profession, starting a family, having a life, a professional life and you're and I'm working in at Walmart right now because the best I can do because is find find a, I can, is work there because I can't find a planning job I also will say that I find a lot of the positions will say even entry level will say four or five years a couple of years experience well when you're young and just starting in the profession, you need a job to get experience. You can't just get in its, and you're getting just beat out by people who have more experience. Well, yeah, they've been in the profession longer because they're older and got a degree. And with tuition being as high as it is, a lot of planners need to do their masters while they're working. They need an income coming in while they're working. In most professions, you, you do your master's when you're working. And I think requiring an, a, a tech to, to get a master's degree where you could be seven, 60 grand in debt to make 30 grand a year is really limiting the profession to people who have already been in the profession for years and got hired when you only needed a bachelor's. This tuition just keeps going up. School's becoming more and more expensive and it's limiting income, it's limiting age groups, it's limiting, not to mention disabilities. People may not be able to jump into a master's program. It, like for me, things take a little longer. And I get, I've had bosses I get frustrated with my ability to finish a task quickly. I can do it, but I it may take me a little longer. I'll finish the tasks on time. It just may not be, if you expect things done like that, it, I, I always try to get a little, I because I know what I deal with, I always try to, if things are slow, I'll get ahead on some, work on a project that's due two months from now. Because I know if I don't start now, it may be crazy busy when you may, it may have 300 permits come in the week that this project's due and you don't have time to work on it. So you, I, for me, I always jump ahead to get, find ways of getting things done so that I can make up for the fact it may take me a little longer than the typical person. But it's it's a lot of employers and supervisors don't aren't willing to put up with someone that processes things slower. And it's they just didn't or they realize that, hey, because they're protected under the ADA, if we hire that person with autism and we don't like them, it's a lot harder to get rid of them. So they find other things to other reasons to not hire in the hiring process because it's hard, it's a lot easier to say, oh, someone has a little bit more experience or they're more experienced in this one area than it is, than it is necessarily somebody that is, than it is to try to let them go if you have performance issues in, once they're hired because you can go to the union and say, hey, I was discriminated against. Because now you're, even in, even in the six month probation, the union can challenge and say that you were discriminated against.
but if they don't hire you, the union can't do anything. So you find that that ends up being just, they find they can, it's always easy to find something to pick out of an argument if you don't want to pick make a reason to not hire someone if you don't want to hire them. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us, Nathan. And I'm, I'm certainly sorry, and I know many attendees will be as well at the at the difficulties you've experienced. And I really admire your perseverance and in, in not giving up on your dream in this case. And I think for all of us as members and attendees today, uh, hopefully, you know, of course, we're learning from your experience how to be better um, managers, uh, better peers, better allies, and I appreciate you sharing that with us, and I hope all of us will, will take that reflection and back to our workplaces and say, hey, if we see someone who's struggling, what, what can I do to make a difference? And I know you and I have connected and we'll be talking soon about interviewing and, and trying to showcase all of your abilities and talent. So thank you for those insights today. And I know attendees in the chat have already responded and appreciated those points. So thank you and look forward to more conversations with you. I know our next uh, participant who has her hand raised is Ali Ankurovic. Again, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, correct me right away uh, because definitely want to honor you that way. And Ali, if you're ready, uh, we can, you can share your comments. Hi, yes, thank you so much. And yes, this is Ali Ankadovich. I use she, her pronouns. Um, uh, first, I just wanna thank everybody uh, who's spoken today, especially speaking about some of the really difficult things that they've faced um, and sharing their personal experiences. Um, uh, thank you for that. I just wanted to touch on a question I submitted earlier and you know, maybe this is something that warrants a little bit more research on my part, but I'm wondering, you know, one thing is uh, kind of the practices within organizations, um, local governments, firms uh, that might employ planners. Uh, another thing that's been brought to my attention is just broader advocacy efforts in the political realm. And I am aware of certain efforts from APA National and the state APA Florida uh, weighing in on some legislative proposals uh, because I get the emails. Uh, the recent ones I've just been seeing since I've kind of had that on my radar have dealt seemingly more with infrastructure and things like that. But I'm wondering if that's something that would uh, kind of uh, dovetail with this issue, if that's something we could do more on in terms of taking uh, positions on certain policies that are being proposed. Uh, that might get at some of the structural issues that people face in the broader communities we're working in and um, where planners are coming from from diverse backgrounds uh, that might provide some you know relief to some of those barriers people are facing before we're even talking about workforce training or hiring or inclusive practices you know just fair housing things like that uh, so if anyone has more information or things I could check out, even if, if that's something that's already happening, I'd be very interested. Thank you, Ali, for those comments and would invite people in the chat to respond with uh, their suggestions. I know at the national level, I think besides looking at the uh, pandemic relief efforts that, are, of course, are currently in Congress and, and so complex, I think uh, what I'm aware of is they're working also on the climate policy guide and I think have that open for comments right now uh, through the month of August. Some of the climate policies do have equity components so would encourage folks to take a look at that and, and talk about how equity can be foregrounded in those efforts uh, much more based on your experiences. I know uh, Wyatt Bowers also through his leadership of, of the state uh, legislative policy committee you know that there are some components in the state legislative platform, but I think we would all welcome suggestions for how equity and diversity and inclusion activities uh, can be promoted at both the state and the national levels. I know sometimes it's hard too with APA National because there's so much going on to connect with every little thing. They do have an equity, diversity, and inclusion page, and so uh, if we need to bring more of those things together on the chapter page and make that easier for our members to engage, We'll certainly take that feedback and, and thank you. And again, look for responses in the chat. Uh, for our next comment, uh, I'd like to turn to Conroy Jacobs, uh, who's had his hand up, very patient. Thank you, Conroy. Uh, looking forward to your comments. 
thank you for allowing me the opportunity to comment. Uh, I also want to extend um, gratitude to all of the panelists who have shared um, some of their uh, personal experiences. I'm sure uh, the time allotted here uh, is probably not enough to cover uh, a lot of other issues, but they certainly did touch on some issues that minorities like myself do experience uh, working in the planning industry and more specifically uh, in the public sector. So one of the things I want to say is just to echo the comment I made uh, in the comments section because I too have experienced um, harassment and discrimination in the uh, in the workplace and you know one of the panelists mentioned uh, that one of the steps uh, to us having a better society more diversity and inclusion and equity was speaking up but there is a culture there is a culture within uh, most uh, organizations I, just, I don't want to say public because my career has been in the public realm for majority of my professional career but there's a certain culture where you know speaking up off, often result in you getting booted out and i think you know the the organization the apa um, organization can offer some assistance to some of those planners who are part of the organization or practicing planning who are a, a part of the uh, minority uh, population, offer them some assistance with understanding the laws which governs uh, harassment and discrimination in the workplace and how they go about resolving some of those issues because, you know, the culture is that you, you speak up and it goes around. I've been in places where I've experienced it and I have friends who are, are not minorities who have witnessed it or, you know, and they come to me and they tell me that, hey, it's best to keep quiet. You know, if you want to keep your job, it's best to keep quiet um, so you can have meaningful income to take care of you and take care of your family because that's just the culture. That's the history of what goes on here, you know. And, you know, of course, those in um, leadership positions per se or management roles being directors and, and whatnot, uh, they uphold, a lot of them uphold such a culture um, because, uh, you know, uh, I've seen cases where I myself has re have reported it or witnessed it and speak out against it and it was dismissed, you know, it's either it, it was not believed or they tend to say there's not enough evidence to prove such a claim, you know, total downplaying it. And you know, uh, taking it up to HR in, in, in some cases often result in e even further um, uh, repercussions with you getting be you getting treated um, uh, getting ill treated um, by your director from your director down to the management and supervisory level, where you find that you're now being tasked with doing uh, things tasks that are not you know, usually part of your job description, you know, taking out the trash, not just an example, um, not, not, not realistically. So, you know, there's not enough protection in the workplace in which, it, you know, the, the event occurred. I know I can't speak for everybody, but I can definitely speak uh, for myself. And I know that other people are probably experiencing the same thing where they experienced the discrimination, they witnessed it, whether they're minorities or, or, or not, you know, have witnessed it. And there's this fear of speaking up because you want to keep your job, you know, and you'll hear things like, oh, it's like that everywhere. It's part of the culture. You're, you're, you know, you, you just have to learn how to put up with it pretty much, you know, and, and, and I, for one, you know, a lot of people will look at my uh, resume. Oh, you spent two years here, three years here, a year and a half there. You know, that's not good for your resume. But, you know, there got to be a, 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 some kind of hotline. I don't know what you can call it, where planners can get that support. Because, you know, with my personality, I was able to overcome a lot of that and looking out for myself 
and and standing up for what I believe in and having respect for myself, you know, to understand that, hey, you got to find, you know, somewhere else. If it's like that everywhere else, then you probably have to create your own job, create your own work and and, and practice what you, you, you believe in. So, uh, you know, I'm just appealing to those who may have, uh, you know, the opportunity to create uh, such a a channel to allow planners who have witnessed it or experienced it to openly express the situation and offer them that support because a lot of planners might be in jobs right now only because of that fear. They don't want to speak up. And like the panelists mentioned, if, if we don't speak up, there will be no change because we won't understand the magnitude of the damage and, 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 and the suffering that a lot of minorities are facing, whether it be uh, women, you know, African-Americans, Asians, you know, um, in, in our, in our pra- practice and, and profession. Well, thank you, Conroy. Thanks I, again. I, I... I regret the difficulties that you're experiencing in the workplace and have to say that uh, this that's exactly why we're here, uh, to be able to create the culture of belonging, you know, that Dan sketched out for us and make sure that we all have the workplaces we deserve or the ability to create better ones for ourselves, as you highlighted uh, through your experience. I, I want to say, too, in this setting, uh, one thing that we will be taking to the executive committee for their consideration is a Lessons from Leaders series where we showcase and hear insights from um, leaders with, with throughout Florida on their advice and resources for helping members of different communities move to the next level um, and realize their talent and potential. And so if you would, are interested in uh, helping with that, would like to participate or would like to recommend someone, please get in touch as we shape that comment and bring it to the executive committee. So thank you, Conroy, for that valuable feedback. And, for our next uh, comments, I know Andre Anderson uh, would like to weigh in, and then we'll be turning to Melissa Dickens. Again, uh, we still have time for a couple more comments, so please raise your hand so we can hear from you. Thank you. Andre. Thanks, Alyssa. I appreciate the comments that everyone has offered so far. Um, it breaks my heart to hear some of the challenges that a lot of folks are, are, are facing. Um, I myself you know, have experienced some of these same situations. Um, I guess at the beginning, I didn't tell you very much about myself, but um, my experience is um, I was born um, in Jamaica. Um, So I um, emigrated here to the United States when I was 15. So that was, you know, so many years ago. And um, I am a citizen of the United States. And growing up in Jamaica, uh, we have a wide diversity of cultures and races there. And so to me, the idea of being different, being black, was never something I thought about. Um, It was, you know, you had Asians, you had Syrians, you had, you know, just different, a whole, you know, mix of of different types of of individuals. And it wasn't until I emigrated to the United States that then I realized that I was different. And it was very shocking to me initially. couldn't understand, and I couldn't wrap my head around why it is that my color made a difference and why I was treated differently. And I persevered through that and just kept going. And I said, you know what, I, I'm not gonna worry about it. And, and I think that's why I developed this, as I said earlier, this, this sense of just being fearless. I didn't care anymore, I just kind of barreled through. If I was the only black person in a room, I didn't care. I, needed to go there because I was going there for a reason, whether it's to learn something or whatever. And I didn't worry about the fact that I was the only black person in a room of of many others. And so um, that kind of spurred me on to keep going. And the more I felt challenged for my color, my race or ethnicity, 
the more I wanted to keep going. And so, you know, I went through college, I got multiple degrees and I just kept going and, you know, decided that I wasn't going to keep stop. And, and part of that also was just a, a training that I, uh, and counseling that I got from my, from, from my parents, specifically from my mother, that said, you, you know, as a black man, you probably have to work twice as hard just to be considered equal to um, your counterparts in, in the workplace. And so that's what I had to do many times. And it, you know, it's paid off over the years because I've, I've just persevered all, all through that through that experience. And, you know, now, pardon me, and now, um, you know, I'm, for lack of a better term, at the top of my career and I, I, I'm a director, you know, of an organization, I have staff and so on that work for me. And I try to make sure that everything that I do includes inclusion, includes diversity. And generally the planning office of any organization tends to be, except for maybe the engineering department, tends to be probably one of the most educated as far as degrees. You know, the planning department tends to have a lot of employees that have advanced degrees and same thing with engineering department. But the other departments tend to be more, maybe more blue collar or, you know, you know, first few years of college. And, but that's never been my criteria only for hiring individuals. It's been, what can they bring to the organization that creates diversity or creates interest? Because everybody has a different perspective. Everybody has a different experience. And I like that. And it's, it's funny because two little quick stories. One was many years ago, APA Florida had a retreat in Seaside. And I can't figure what year it was, but it was many years ago. I, I can't remember now. But it was a great retreat. And at that time, you know, we had a, a good mix of, of folks. And it was interesting. We were sitting in this great house and Alex McGee, our executive director, she had cooked and made all this great food. And it was just this great experience. And when I just stood back and looked, I saw this great mix of individuals and perspectives and conversations. And we took a photograph of that. And the photograph just showed this really great mix of folks. And I considered that at the time, in my mind, it reminded me of this Italian clothing company, which some of you may know, um, United Colors of Benetton, how they have this very diverse mix of people and colors and everything. And Ever since that day, I've made it my goal to ensure that people that I hire sort of exemplifies that. And so in my department, in the past few years, I had a very, very diverse group of, of employees. I had Russian, I had a Japanese, I had a Chinese, I had black, I had white, I had women, I had men. I mean, and so it was this, this really, interesting melting pot. And so one of the things that I, I continue to do today is to kind of create that really diverse group of individuals and perspective, because I think that's important to create this rich culture. The other um, quick story I want to tell you is, uh, or comment I want to make is on um, um, the comment about, um, I, think, I, I think that was that came from Ali, about the broader advocacy efforts Back in San Francisco, I guess a few years ago, APA National finally adopted an official diversity inclusion policy. And since that time, everything that APA National does includes a perspective on diversity and inclusion, meaning that everything regarding their hiring practices, regarding their conference sessions, regarding events that they put on and so on, has to take into account whether that event or conference or event or um, session includes acknowledgement of diversity and inclusion. And the reason I know this is I sit on their committee for selecting conference sessions. 
and that as that's a specific criteria they have to score each session is the panel diverse is the topic diverse or does the topic include some consideration for diversity so i think apa national is is making strides in doing that and i think we as apa florida has also done that because now we have also required that as laura and Alyssa said earlier um you know the executive committee has engaged the edi to review our policies to review the conference sessions to make sure that they have that that that, that wide variety so um you know it's a first step and i expect that we will continue to um, be diverse and to be inclusive and to ensure that we um, advocate for equity among all our members i think you know our next one one of our next steps of course is really about education i think there's a lot of resources out there that we need to to learn from to understand the common language of diversity and equity and inclusion so we understand what it is so we know what it is when we see it and can better address it if there is some inequity or some divisiveness that that occurs in our everyday um, existence um, that was my final point and to Dagmarie's point um, you already answered the question but I just want to kind of highlight it uh, when you talked about your accent and my question was going to be to you do you feel that your accent gets you dis discounted as far as being intelligent or being or having opinion and you are actually answer that for me and I, and I appreciate it because i think you know i've been told that same thing too you know, being from jamaica i tend to have a little of an accent i don't hear it but people hear it and you know they you know you, they tend to sometimes just go well he's from jamaica he doesn't know what he's talking about or she's from puerto rico or he's from wherever you know and you know they don't know what what's about and that's not true because you know a lot of us you know many of us all of us are very intelligent but the fact that we may have a slightly different accent doesn't mean that we don't understand or know what it is that we're talking about so Dagmarie I do appreciate your comment about your accent yeah Andre and one thing I wanted to add in respect to that is about the education that people about especially management is to educate themselves in this aspect it got to the point that I was even I even had one supervisor to put it as he wrote it in my um, evaluation that um, his recommendation was for me to work on my accent so because it will be easier for the board to understand or, or you know or it will improve my presentation skills and at the time I didn't think much of most of it much of it and later when i started thinking about it i'm like wait this this is not this is not right and i mean and what what do you say or something like that i said thank you for your suggestion but i'm not gonna i'm proud of my accent it shows that not only i can speak two languages but i can think twice as much as anybody else <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You Agreed, can think Dag Murray. Thank in two you different languages. That's, that, that's always amazing in speaking two different languages or thinking two different languages. So yeah, I, I always admire people that are bilingual, trilingual, whatever. And you know, for many years I have tried, oh, I need to learn some other languages, you know. But yeah, I, I do appreciate you and others that bring such um, richness to our environment. And, and you know, this to me, it, it, it makes my heart sing to listen to all the conversations and more dialogues that we'll have in the future as we move along. So again, thank you all for your participation. But I'll turn it back over to Alyssa. Yes, thank you, Andre. We appreciate your comments and as always your leadership and commitment to our mission and the steps we have to take going forward. And I think you've outlined several of those. I think you're muted, Alyssa. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll turn it over to, <laughs> thank you. We'll turn it over to Melissa Dickens uh, and company. Hi. <laughs> and yeah, hi, hi everyone. Thanks so much. I have my assistant here with me. Um, awesome. <laughs> uh, first, I really wanted to say thank you so much to everyone on the panel who's given, who have all given some really great insight and suggestions today and everyone who's attending. Um, I want to uh, build on something that I think 
Conroy mentioned, oh man, thank you, uh, that I think Conroy mentioned, which I think would be helpful if APA Florida can come up with some tools for how to address the potential backlash that sometimes happens when people raise this issue. Um, you know, I know it's something that uh, uh, folks have experienced um, raising issues. And the other thing I would say is the importance of allies cannot be underscored enough, um, you know, whether it's allies on race or, or gender or disability, any of the topics that we've discussed today. Um, there, there was an article that I put in the chat um, about how uh, sometimes when women and my, uh, people of color bring up issues, they're, they're penalized, but when white men bring up issues, they're not, and it the the context changes. So, really appreciate um, all of the people on the call, all of the allies on the call. Um, but I think doing more to um, or, or giving the members tools to communicate these issues, to communicate them in a, in an effective manner when people may be skeptical that there's a problem or may, uh, may even react negatively when these issues are raised, I think would be something important for the chapter to, to take on. So thanks everyone, I really appreciated this discussion. Thank you, Melissa, appreciate you joining us today and for your leadership on the Women in Planning Division. And I'd like to encourage everyone who is not a member of one of the uh, fantastic divisions that APA National has, Planning in the Black Community, um, there's a divisions for many of these communities and it, it more emerging all the time. So if it's money well spent to be able to support efforts like this at the national level, so would encourage folks to join as many of those groups as, as they're able and support them either as community members or allies. So with that, I do not see any other hands raised. Um, if, if folks would like to just take a moment to uh, check out the resources in the chat, we've had some great ideas about uh, newsletter articles on the survey results, um, appreciation of veterans and the communities we're looking at, um, and some other insights as far as being bilingual and, and the talent and the capabilities that that brings. Would encourage folks to check out the chat, but I wanna turn it back over to our panel for some thoughts on next steps and uh, what we need to do going forward to make sure that everyone's uh, feedback is acted on and realized here. We've heard some great suggestions. I, I, I think we know our work is only just beginning. Uh, and, and what is it you feel as panelists that, that you um, need us to consider? Well, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, we need, we need, um, we need mentorship and training for our upper management. Um, I think that's key for creating an environment that is more inclusive and diverse. Um, and that's what, and, and I mean, I, I think this is the beginning of a bright future. This is the beginning of a, of a great movement that, I mean, as far as, as I'm involved in planning, I am going to be 100% involved and make sure that I try to create the places where all people feel safe and include, include. And, um, and, but I cannot emphasize enough, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. Yeah, I'm happy to, to um, jump in next. I, I was, I particularly appreciated um, um, Conroy Jacobs and, and his comments and sharing his experience because um, at once Conroy gave us both the, the diagnosis of the problem and he gave us the solution, okay? If you don't take away anything from this panel except the realization that these issues are systemic, Okay, and the institute, institutions, companies, people are all resistant to change. 
If there's a narrative where you can avoid the change, people have a tendency to go in that direction. But this is, this is both a person to person issue and a systemic issue. Um, what Melissa shared with us, critical, right? Call out what isn't right. Um, allies are so important. I, I cannot tell you how, you know, it, it, we, everybody remember this thing we call the Me Too movement, right? Calling out things and saying, what was acceptable in the 80s and 90s, this is no longer acceptable. We're not gonna take it. And to move to a place where you're gonna get called out if you do something that's absolutely you know, crazy and foolish. And you're gonna get called out not just by the person that's the victim, but they're gonna get called out by the broader organization because we're all saying this isn't right. And we're, 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 we're sharing that with the group. I, I think, remember, we're, we're in a process, so this work doesn't end. So we have to weave into, I was trying to use this example earlier about sustainability, weave it into everything we do, every decision you make, all the work that you do. Is this equitable? Am I encouraging inclusion or am I excluding someone? Do I have a diverse group of people involved in what we're trying to do? You know, in, in every single listen, just about every planning activity has these dimensions. It's not just about advocacy or policy. It's about what happens in the trenches. And it's about weaving this through everything we do as an organization, through how you react at work, and, and, and getting all of this expressed um, uh, together as part of what you consider uh, as, as you move through life. That, that's, that's what I want to share. Go ahead, Justin. Okay. <laughs> um, I thought the two comments from uh, Dagmarie and Dan were pretty pretty spot on there. Um, <clears throat> I think mentorship and allyship are two huge things, and I think it's. And then the other thing that that Dan just said that kind of stuck with me uh, is, I think people that don't already understand it kind of need to understand kind of the systemic nature of these things and how they're built into not just planning, but just in society as a whole and how though that, that system and those those systemic issues with bias and racism, they 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 go, they parade, they go throughout everything. And it's I thought it was really interesting that Andre mentioned the um the talk that the the, the thing that his mother mentioned to him about, you know, being, about having to work twice as hard, um, you know, just to kind of get, you know, even to like the the equal level. And it's funny because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Native American, I'm, I'm, I was born here in America, and I'm of a different age cohort than Andre, and I grew up in a totally different way, yet we got the same exact thing, we've heard the same exact thing from our parents before, and that should tell you something about society as a whole, and also with, you know, not only just our profession, but society as a whole, that two very different, two people from different backgrounds get the same exact information. And it's because both of our parents both know there's a reason that they told us that. And so it's, they understand that and they're telling that to us. And so when you're in, to bring that back to our, our profession as a whole, we have to have those allies that are able to, to understand that and walk with us. And that's, that not only helps us as planners and helping up kind of that next generation, but also even helps you in your professional work and, and how you bring that to looking at the problems or the different things that you're addressing, whether it be housing or transportation or, or land use or zoning issues or anything like that. How does that reflect and kind of help you in that professional way too? So it's, um, you know, being, being allies to people who are experiencing these things and, and listening to them and understanding them. And again, also being mentors to them and then and helping them along this path and, and walking with them, and not just, not just saying, oh, I hear you, but also, you know, helping and assisting with that, so. <clears throat> Thanks, Thanks uh, Justin. Um, here's what I, my takeaway. My takeaway is that we've heard some really um, um, heartbreaking comments um, during this process. Um, we have a survey and everyone please um, appreciate 
what Alyssa and Dagmarie did just to get the summary available for you to take a look at. Um, you provided a lot of good, good information and we as a committee will need to take a little bit of time to drill down and get a fuller and complete understanding of everything that has been said and um, both in terms of what the needs are, but also in terms of recommendation. So um, bear with us as we do that. Um, take into account that I've really learned from this um, on multiple levels. Um, number one, good gracious, I'm doing a Zoom meeting. Um, so it is possible to treat, teach an, all, an old dog new tricks. Alyssa should know this. I was old when she met me and when she first started working with me at the Regional Planning Council. I'm ancient now. But the part is learning. There's so much good information um, that's been presented. And what we want to do is figure out how do we take that and how do we move forward? Um, you know, Dag Marie has mentioned um, mentorship. One of the things that I have, have in mind is we have to figure out, I, she, she, Dag Marie is saying mentorship, I'm saying network. Um, how do we connect each other from around this big old state of ours, whether you're in Pensacola or down in Key West, um, you may be looking at and facing similar type issues, but because of that spatial distance, um, how do you know who else is working on these things that you wanna address? Whether it is specifically, how do we have inclusive, available, affordable housing? The foundation of everything from a community point of view, if a person doesn't have safe housing, then that starts messing with everything else in terms of their life. And it's part of a community as well. So how do we have the range, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's Justin dealing with transportation and the, the issue of the fact that, at least from my point of view, we won't deal with transportation, specifically transit, because when, we, when you say transit, people think we're talking about poor people and we don't, that's not me. I'm not gonna ride the bus. Um, I'm going to buy a car and I'm going to be part of that problem as well. And so how do we begin to provide those opportunities, um, whatever the issue may be, education, job training, or just access to the foundations of what you need if you're living in a community and what are those things that are going to be different, you know, in terms of when we start designing parks. Parks no longer need to be universal of the idea that every park's going to have, you know, a kickball field or tennis courts or this, that, and the other. We need to start looking at culturally um, what's happening in that community and how do we provide what that community wants. Um, are we, you know, for instance, if we're looking at um, a Caribbean or Latin Latinx community, um, I I'll tell you what, I've learned. I want to play some dominoes. Um, but also, you know, you know, you may want to have the chess tables that are there as well. And so, you know, there's a passive as well as the active. I noticed one of the things that was happening here in Apopka, um, in Apopka, um, you know, over almost 30% of Apopka is Latinx. But when I was working with them, um, people started with the assumption that it was primarily people um, from Mexico. No, baby. Um, it's the range of South and Central uh, Americans that are also living here in Apopka. And, they want soccer fields. Um, and so how do you deal with, like I said, based on populations, what are we learning? And so for me, next steps, we gotta drill down the survey information, um, provide comments and tell us, I know this was um, two hours and what's next? Do we have another Zoom meeting? Um, what's the topic of that? How frequently do we get together on this? Um, all of those things are part of the next steps and I think that the committee will be doing a summary of what happened today um, along with the summary of the survey and we can begin to start talking about um, the mentorships, the networking, and even drilling down in terms of, I would ask, if it's okay, I want to ask Nathan 
you know, what's the area of planning that you want to practice that you haven't been allowed to practice? And geographically, if it's okay, where are you? Um, if you can provide, you know, if you can provide that information um, as a private comment to me, um, one of the things there is, you know, how do we begin to, um, that's a mentorship of helping Nathan with his efforts to become a full-time member of the profession. Um, and then also, you know, in terms of um, the, the, you know, the other comments about how do we deal with systemic racism and everything else. But, you know, we, we got to start with the individual and as well as the collective. Thank you very much, everyone. I've, I've had a wonderful time today, um, which was the last comment on the ground rules. Have fun. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate you uh, sharing that perspective and the direct of uh, reaching out to helping Nathan. And then again, would encourage all of us to consider how we can make that difference today. It's not something we have to wait on anyone else to do. And you know, see if if there's something you can do to follow Bob's good example, and and all of us will be better off. So with that, of course, we're at the end of our scheduled time. As Bob mentioned, you know, we look to you for suggestions on when you'd like to get together again, continue this conversation. As Laura pointed out in the chat, we'll be holding a session like this one uh, next month at the. Florida Planning Conference on Wednesday evening. Hope you can join us there and please spread the word. And again, really appreciate your valuable time, your insights, your story, your willingness to connect with us and we're grateful for it and we hope to continue this conversation soon. Thank you everyone and enjoy your day.